Hi, I'm Christopher Ray, and welcome to the third of three video lectures about Wu Mingyi's novel, The Man with the Compound Eyes. Please also take a look at the brief video introduction I made to Wu's life and works. Some translations of this novel render the title as the man with the double eyes, or the kind of double vision, but I think that compound eyes is actually more accurate, because I believe that in the ecological view of this novel, we need a type of compound multifaceted vision in order to understand things properly. So in this video lecture, I want to focus on this motif of compound vision. At one point in the novel, the narrator comments that the complex interdependency of any ecological system is beyond human imagining. In this novel, we have a non-human avatar, or only kind of a semi-human avatar. He is called a ren, a man, but he possesses a type of non-human vision that it suggests is necessary. I would call it an ecological vision for understanding the world. This is a novel that begins with a type of tunnel vision. We have engineers boring through a mountain to create a tunnel, and suddenly the mountain responds. And this is the hollow heart of the mountain that seems like we're hearing beating. The novel begins underground. There's a lot of discussion of maritime matters, but then we also meet the man with the compound eyes on land, on the island of Taiwan. There are only a few characters who actually see and can perceive the man with the compound eyes. This includes some of the indigenous inhabitants of the island, and these various characters are represented as encountering the man with the compound eyes when they're kind of on the brink, on the brink of a cliff or between life and death. So there seems to be some suggestion that it is only when one is on the brink that one's vision kind of compounds in different ways, that one can understand the truth. I also want to point out that within this novel, we have multiple types of compounding. We have a compounding of language. We have compounding of plot elements that seem to repeat, sometimes not twice, but multiple times. And there's a type of compounding of storytelling through all of the different narratorial voices that we get through the novel, which create a kind of narrative mosaic. Finally, I want to talk about one theory of this compound vision that's not just of the natural world, but is also something of a product of screen culture, where we have screens as well as eyes of creatures looking back at us. So we begin with tunnel vision and also with tunnel sounds. So we have this kind of booming heart of the mountain. This is as Detlef Bolt and Jun Xiangli are digging a tunnel through Taiwan's central mountain range. This is a tremendous project, a marvelous engineering feat that also takes a tremendous toll. Lee's brother commits suicide as soon as the tunnel is completed, and Bolt wonders if the project had been worthwhile. The tunnel is located in northeastern Taiwan, and it connects the capital of Taipei to Ilan County in eastern Taiwan, just north of Hualien. The tunnel opened in 2006, just a few years before The Man with the Compound Eyes was published. This was a 15-year project that claimed the lives of many workers and was repeatedly interrupted by the instability of the mountain itself. This novel has strong sonic elements too. We have characters like Atile and Hafei who sing. We have the booming heart of this empty mountain. But we also have an exploration of vision from multiple perspectives. Societal, civilizational, ecological, tribal, human, animal supernatural, and artistic. We have characters who seek but don't find. We have characters who seem to hallucinate. And again, the visions represented in this novel are not purely human. Compound itself is a word with multiple meanings. It could mean multiple, it could mean multiplied or repeated, complex, overlapping, complicated, fragmented, mixed, or merged. In English, we have compound words like cut purse. There are also, of course, chemical compounds. A compound bow can increase shooting force. Then, of course, there are compound eyes by which many insects see the world. But let's take a look at a key structural element of this novel, which compounds its own plot. So these are just a few of many possible examples. Ina's home is flooded, then her daughter Hafei's home is flooded. Alice loses a loved one, then her colleague loses a loved one. Atile and Alice both jump from their islands into the sea around the same time. Hafei and Millet both share the same name. Hafei means Millet in the Panka language. There's also a shift later in the novel when the narrative moves away from Taiwan over to Norway or to Canada. So we get these non-Taiwan-centric perspectives. As I mentioned in a previous video lecture, the perspectives on a single island like Taiwan are also multiple. They also compound when we have the accounts of these different characters like Atile, Alice, Dahu, and Hafei. These are just a few of the main characters in the novel, and if you look at the names in bold, their stories are told both through third-person narration, where we have this omniscient, anonymous narrator, and in first-person narration, when they're telling their own stories as an eye narrator. I would argue that Wu Mingyi's novel is structured very deliberately such that these stories repeat each other, they echo each other, they intersect and complement each other, 
kind of like colors in a mosaic. In this course, we've looked at other novels that are interested in replication and that have very strong ecological consciousness. But Wu Mingyi's novel creates a different type of hybrid motif where we have kind of the insect and the human coming together into this being of the man with the compound eyes. Let's take a look at just three of several appearances by this character. One is after Ina's home has been washed away and she has lost this man that she has a relationship with, and Hafei sees in front of Ina the man with the compound eyes. And shortly thereafter, they find Old Liao's watery corpse. So the man with the compound eyes seems to be able to communicate about death. The man with the compound eyes also appears to another indigenous character, the Bunun tribesman Dahu, when he's a young man. And he is discovering he's not a very good hunter. And he's kind of confronted with this fact by this anthropomorphic character, the man with the compound eyes, when he's really standing at the brink of a major life decision. Another example is when Toto seems to see the man with the compound eyes and discovers himself standing at the edge of a cliff or a void. Like with Hafei, it seems like some connection with death is imminent, and like Dahu, it seems like he is on the brink. But this moment is particularly hard to interpret in retrospect after we discover that this may be a projection of Alice, or a story that she is telling about the loss of her son. So the types of vision represented in the novel are not just retrospective, and they're not just present tense. We also have foresight, so there's this one example where Hafei did not shed a single tear when she saw the seventh Sissid collapse, probably because she had a premonition that one day the house would have to be returned most suitably to the sea. We have multiple humans dive headfirst into the water, but this is a dwelling that also is reclaimed by the sea. Why the seventh Sissid? Hafei later sings a song by Bob Dylan, which she doesn't understand, but it includes the line, I've stepped in the middle of seven sad forests. So I've argued that this novel compounds its narrative structure. I would also argue that it compounds language at the unit of the word. So I gave that example previously of things that we do not understand are called gesi. Here, Atele realizes that even the sea sage and the earth sage would not be able to understand a floating island of garbage. And so he calls it gesi gesi. There are several moments in the novel where we have gatherings of butterflies. And butterflies can have eyes, at least the appearance of eyes, on their wings. And so it's almost like we have a creation of a compound eyes through multiple different life forms that are all part of the same ecosystem. For example, shortly before Alice, who's looking for Ohio, the cat, discovers a tele, tens, no hundreds of butterflies or moths that must have been hiding in the grass until Alice disturbed them, flew to the other side of the slide in an undisciplined but seemingly coordinated fashion. There are other moments in the novel where Tom and Toto or other characters are discussing butterflies. So I would consider this connection between the butterflies and the character of the man with compound eyes as being somewhat implicit. But I think that both of them are connected to a vision of an entire ecosystem. The English translator of this novel, Derek Stark, has written a very interesting essay in which he talks about the man with the compound eyes as showing a kind of postmodern ecological sublime, which he sees as being crystallized within the video mosaic gaze of the title character, that we're getting a type of montage narration montage storytelling, and a type of ecological writing that is not just nature writing, it is also techno writing. Stirk argues that what we see in the compound eyes is not just a type of natural vision, it is also a type of screen vision and screen reflection. A mosaic, of course, is different colored tiles put together to form a pattern. When Tom is lying there dying, he seeks assistance from the man with the compound eyes, but the man with the compound eyes does not intervene. And this is what Tom sees. Since you are watching this on a screen, I suggest that you freeze frame right now so that you can read the entire passage before we discuss it. We have a story, a documentary video being portrayed in each omatidium. So we are not just gazing into nature, we are gazing into a type of technologically mediated vision of nature. One that is overwhelming, one that is sublime in this vastness. Human vision can just not cope with all the screens that we have to face. We look at this multitude of screens and are overwhelmed by them. We're kind of paralyzed by all of these different visions. In Wu Mingyi's novel, these screens also look back at us, but they too cannot intervene. They cannot take action. They can only watch. I would argue that in The Man with the Compound Eyes, as well as in other works like The Stolen Bicycle, and you can see in this passage here about butterflies, that we need to view nature through a different paradigm than beauty or the picturesque. So we need a view of nature that moves beyond the view. We need to actually take action. We can't just be bystanders or watchers. For all of the death and destruction and despair in The Man with the Compound Eyes, I think it also closes with a note of hope. There's a moment midway through the novel when Attila is telling a story 
When I was young, my father told me that a long, long time ago, the sea sage and the earth sage were one and the same, until there came a day when the wife of the sea sage had twins. They squeezed out of her birth canal side by side without priority. One was blue-eyed, while the other's eyes were dark brown. And we remember that according to the customs of Wayo Wayo, it is the second son who has to leave the island. But since they come out simultaneously, which one is the second son? And the final vision that we get with the man with the compound eyes is of this reincarnation or this other avatar of the sea sage and the earth sage in one, of Ohio, the cat. The cat raises her amazing little head, opens her eyes, one blue and the other brown, and responding to Alice's call, looks right back at her.